Loss is a very difficult thing to deal with. And all of us experience it at different times in different ways. Even this week, our nation has experienced it vicariously. So I want to start this service by praying. Join me. Father, Lord, even looking at the topic already brings up lots of different emotions. Lord, we live in a world that is not as you designed it. You did not want us to fully understand loss or sin or evil. And yet, Lord, you said that you would never leave us or forsake us. That even though we are learning what sin does and how deeply it affects us, that, Lord, we are not alone. And, Father, we ask that in this service today that you would not only be the God of all comfort for every one of us, but that, Lord, you would give us the ability to be able to go and to give that to others. And that our time together today would equip us and help us in that endeavor. And, Father, we do lift up the the families uh, in Connecticut Uh, that are experiencing tragic loss. Some losing co-workers, husbands and wives, and family members, and many families experiencing the loss of a small child. No words can comfort that grief. It is going to take the supernatural work of your Holy Spirit to carry these families. And Father, for every single one of us that sit in this room that would have loss, that would have uh, trauma in our lives, Father, you have to be the Prince of Peace. You have to bind up the brokenhearted and heal their wounds. And so, Lord, we ask that our time together today would be fruitful toward that supernatural end. And so, Lord, we just give ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh. You know, as we, as we look at loss this morning, and some of that loss is death, but there are vast different ways that we experience loss in our life, not just with death. But Friday was a very sobering day because... The depth of that tragedy, we're talking about very small children, touches and, and kind of unnerves us in a way that it was so senseless. And, and to try to figure out how in the world someone could do something like that is almost beyond us, I mean, to, to try to sit back. And, you know, as I, as I prayed for those families, as I thought about how, how do you comfort, how do you, how do you walk with someone in the middle of a, of a very, uh, almost unfathomable? You know, we, we may come up in the next week or so during the investigation with, with some inkling as to what was going on in this young man's mind, but probably we will never know. Not really. We may find out that there was some trauma in his life. We may find out that there was a a place of mental illness, you know. But even then, it's not going to to give us the ability to go, oh, well, it's okay. You know, we're we're never going to find that that place where we can truly understand what is going on. But one of the things that, that I have been gripped with, even as I thought about this, is the fact that we live in America. And we are unbelievably sheltered. We are unbelievably sheltered. When 9-11 happened, it turned our world inside out. People walked around stunned for days at what happened 
in those terrorist attacks. But what we don't realize is that people who live in Israel face that every day, and they have for the last 20 years. To have a car bomb go off in a restaurant, to have a bus explode, is something that they have seen every month for the last 20 years. It happens all the time there. It doesn't happen all the time here. And when it does happen, it just completely un... But we don't realize we live in a very sheltered place. You know, as I thought about these children, and I thought, you know, I mean, you don't, even in a, you know, you don't hear about that much. And then I got to thinking about Africa. And there, there are militant groups in Africa that go in routinely and they will kill all the fathers and then place guns in the hands of the children and make them kill their mothers. And then they will raise them to be the next generation of fighters from children. And you think that, you know, I mean, as, as unfathomable as it is what happened in that, after, that morning on Friday, that there are places in the world that people... Not just one crazed individual, but actual societies are doing things that are unimaginable for those of us that sit in, in America. I mean, you know, to sit here and to not realize that sin and the dysfunction of sin in the world, that we are very sheltered to a lot of it. There's a lot of dysfunction out there. And every time that we look at the world in which we live, we, we are constantly bombarded by the question, God, why is this allowed? Why don't you stop this? You know, why don't you... And I shared, uh, it was probably last week, about Cameron, my son, when we had to put him in that little bank tube and hang him on the, the wall with his little legs over the uh, deal because of his chest. My, my son had a very, very serious chest condition. And uh, when he, he, he could barely speak, and so they had to get chest x-rays. And to get chest x-rays, they had to put him in this little plastic tube to hold him completely still. And they hung him on the wall to put this machine in front of him. To, and he could barely speak, but the whole time he was screaming my name, just going, Daddy, Daddy over and over again, and I was standing, you know, 10 feet from him, and he couldn't understand why he was in such pain, and in the middle of being in pain was then shoved into this little tube, and that I was standing right there and I wouldn't do something. And tears are flooding down my face, and I'm going, buddy, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. He couldn't understand that unless they dealt with this that the rest of his life, would have been hampered. And to see him now, as I said, you know, 6'2", on a tennis scholarship, running and just going wide open. You go, he could never have done that if that issue had not been taken care of that was in his chest. He would, have, he would never have had that opportunity. But he couldn't understand at the time what was going on. And for us, we're in the same position according to Scripture. You see, God created twice in perfection. And yet the angels rebelled. And then mankind rebelled. And God could have continued to do the same thing, just keep creating in perfection, hoping that people would, would not rebel. But God turned it around the other way, and he said, the only way that we're going to have perfection, which is what we really want, a perfect world where there's no sickness, no disease, no sin, no, no uh, murder, no, where every tear is wiped away from our eye. I'm quoting from Revelation, which is where God says we are going. He said the only way that we can get there is that rebellion has to be cast down. Because the angels knew perfection, but they didn't know sin. Mankind knew perfection, but didn't know sin. After the fall, God said this, now they have become like us. They're going to know both good and evil. 
And the reason that heaven will be perfect is not because God doesn't allow sin. Heaven will be perfect because everyone there will know both good and evil. And when we finally have evil completely taken out, anybody volunteering to come back to this garbage? And that's the reason sometimes people will say to me, but why didn't God just really stop the bad stuff? And you go, well, what we're really talking about is can you give us something tolerable that we're willing to live with? And he says, absolutely not. I won't show you just enough to go, yeah, it's not, it's not really good. He goes, I don't ever want to do this again. And it's like I said, when I first gave my life to the Lord, I wanted to go to heaven, but I, I was not convinced everything God said was sin was all that bad. <laughs> it has taken a while for me to get to the place to where I go, everything God calls sin. I may struggle with it. I may in my weak moments desire it, but it is not what I want. Because I know that in the end it never brings what it promises. And God has said, we have to see sin for what it really is. The true, total ugliness of what it is. Otherwise, we may end up doing this over and over and over again. When we stand in heaven, rebellion will be cast down, not because God does anything, but because we will never, ever go back to this because we have seen what it really is. And sometimes, unfortunately, it has to touch us. We can't figure it out if it doesn't touch us. I mean, you know, and, and I'm not to beat up on smokers this morning, but in the last 20 years, there hasn't been one pack of cigarettes that left any factory without the Surgeon General's warning on the side of it. It goes, this is going to damage your physical body. My dad, he used to, my dad used to he'd go, boy, if I ever catch you smoking one of these, I'm going to beat you black and blue. I would go, well, Dad, why don't you quit? He goes, I can't. He goes, I've tried. But you know what? My dad did quit. My dad quit smoking 15 years before he passed away because the doctor told him he had lung cancer and they had to take the top half of both of his lungs and he told him if he kept smoking, he wouldn't live more than a year. And guess what? My dad quit. Unfortunately, it had to touch his life before he found the power to do something about it. And unfortunately, sometimes God understands we have to see it. He can't just tell us we don't get it, unfortunately. And he said, we're not going to do this again. And yet it is hard. It tears at my heart, and I sit with people who are weeping and experiencing loss. And the next thing that we have to know is that heaven is better. And it's hard to know that too, isn't it? I mean, we talk about heaven. You know, I heard a guy one time say, you know, heaven's awesome. The only problem is you've got to die to get there, you know, which is really a bummer. Why? Well, partially because we're afraid of the unknown, you know? I mean, you know, we can talk about heaven, but we've never actually been there. You know, and, and illustrations just fail, but if you were to see a small child in, in Somalia starving of malnutrition, and they were to say, that child, because of the, the circumstances around it, if that child was to die, and obviously this doesn't work, but if that child was to, to, to die, and their entire family was able to be transported to America and then brought back to life. Dying wouldn't be that bad of a deal, would it? To be taken out of that unbelievably impoverished situation and be to brought to a land where they could enjoy the abundance. Death wouldn't be that big of a deal. You know, they're, they're already in, in suffering and agony. And that isn't even a close comparison to what it would be like to step from this life into the presence of God. But it would be hard to sit there with, with that little family and go, listen, it's going to be a lot better. You know, we're going to take your life here, but, you know, <laughs> you, you can't even imagine what it would be like to live in America. It's so different than where you are right here. It is so wonderful. It'll be worth it. 
It's still hard to get our head around that because we're talking about something we've never truly experienced. And to be able to get a handle on what that is going to be is very difficult. And yet in Philippians 1.22, I don't know if you all know, I love the book of Philippians. Paul says these words. He goes, if I go on living in this body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. But what shall I choose? I don't know. I am torn between the two, for I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body, for this relationship that we have. Paul said, I'm torn. He goes, you know, and he was in prison at the time and didn't know if the next day he would be executed or not. And he's going, you know, I may die tomorrow. I don't know. And he goes, and I'm kind of torn because I know that if I die, I'll get to be in the presence of God, which is so much better than all of this. And yet I love you. And I realize that I want to be a part of this relationship. And I believe that's the tug that all of us at some point end up with is the fact that at one point, we're going to step from this life and we're going to stand in the presence of God and when we do, everything will be fine. It's the perspective. You see, the reason that as I stood there and saw my son on that wall, that I could still have hope about this situation even though he was crying projectile tears and screaming my name is because I knew that the end was going to be a great result. They could take care of this issue. They could give him the ability to have the life that I desired for him. He just had to go through this very difficult point in between. And because I could see the big picture, I was able to stay hopeful even in a difficult situation. What is the struggle is when we don't see the big picture, we don't know. When we don't, the Bible says, those who have hope in this life only will be miserable. If my hope is only in this world, I am going to be miserable because there's a lot of hurt and there's a lot of pain and there's a lot of suffering. But if I see the bigger picture, I can have hope. In fact, Scripture says that when we stand in the presence of God, our life here, whether it was five years or 105 years, He said, in retrospect with eternity is going to feel like a mist that appeared for only a moment and then vanished. In comparison with eternity, this life is going to seem like it barely even existed. A vapor that just appeared for a second and was gone. But it's hard to get ourselves in that mindset because this is all we know and it's what we live every day. And we walk through it and and at times it's wonderfully joyous and at other times it is horribly painful. Because it's not what God chose it to be. In 2 Corinthians 5, 1, we read these words. Now we know that if this earthly tent that we live in, this body is destroyed, then we get a building from God, an eternal house in heaven not built by human hands. For while we're in this tent, our earthly body, we groan and we're burdened because we want to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by what is life. And again, it's hard to get our head around that to go, what we're getting ready to get is life. You know, when I shared a funeral, I go, you know, the, all of us that are kicking around, we're all dying. You know what I mean? Every day we're shuffling off dead skin cells. You know what I mean? There's parts of us that are winding down. The individual that we're here to honor today is more alive than any one of us. They are experiencing what all of us hope to experience, perfection. Standing in the presence of God, every tear wiped away from their eye, no sickness, no disease, no mourning, no nothing. Man, the old order has gone away. And I had this unbelievable question. I had a gal ask me, she goes, how in the world can heaven be perfect and no grief? if my husband sees the pain that I'm going through? I went, wow, what a great question. And I went back to that story of me standing beside Cameron. 
I said, as I stood beside Cameron, he was in grief, but I was in faith and hope. I was going, buddy, it's, it's, a, it's a pain, but once we get through this, you're going to have your life back. You're going to have vitality. You're going to be able to run and jump and joyously scream and enjoy life in the full. So I want us to go through this process because I want us to get to the good stuff. And I said, when you see heaven and you know what waits for everyone and you realize that it's going to be perfect because we understand both good and evil, I think you can stand at a distance and go, it's going to be okay. In fact, it's going to be better than you could have ever imagined. It's going to be more than you could... The Bible says, eye hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard, hadn't even entered into our mind what it's going to be like. But God is revealing it through His interaction with us, little tastes of what is going on. But we still got to get by day to day. We still got to get one foot in front of the other in the day to day. So how do we do it? It is God who comforts us. In fact, Jesus, the very first thing that he did when he started into ministry, he walked into the temple, and they handed him the scrolls. And so he took the scroll of Isaiah, and he began to roll it until he got to Isaiah 61, and he read these words. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted and to proclaim freedom to the captives and release from the darkness of, to the prisoners. He goes, I've come to give you hope. Even in the midst of a very fallen world. In fact, Psalm 34, 18 says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. Psalm 147.3 says, He heals the brokenhearted and he binds up their wounds. Paul described it this way. He said, even though everything on the outside was in chaos, I don't even, didn't even know if I would be alive or dead the next day. He said, God did something from the inside and gave me a peace that transcended understanding because it had nothing to do with what was happening around me. Everything around me was chaos. I'm in chains, sitting in a Roman jail. And yet he said, he gave me a peace that transcended my understanding. And it guarded my heart and it guarded my mind. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've been in hospitals with someone about to pass away. And the person in the bed is fine, and everybody around the bed's freaking out. And you see this weird interchange that happens to where the person who knows God is experiencing this unbelievable peace, and they're, they're going, Mama, come here. And they hug him, and they go, you're going to be okay. You're going to be fine, you know. Come here, kids. Right? And you're going, what in the world's going on here, right? You know, here's the person about to, to pass away, and they're taking care of everybody around the bed, and everybody around the bed's freaking out. And I've seen it happen again and again, and it doesn't make sense, but it's the fact that God has already started putting such a peace in that individual's life that they're able to start ministering from that peace to other people who are still around. Losses every day. Obviously, death is one of the greatest losses that we face. But as we look, I mean, things I didn't think about bring grief. Loss of a marriage. Loss of a job. Kids leaving home. A loss of a skill or an ability. I remember the, the time that, that I actually had to come to grips because water skiing had been such a part of my life. And in the grand scheme of life, that's a pretty trivial thing. But, but it was a big deal for me. And when I broke my ankle eight years ago, after the, the number of surgeries, and I just realized I'll probably never be able to do that again. It was, a, you know, a passion of my life. I'm never going to get to do that again. And I remember at one point just being really sad, almost depressed, about going, this part of my life will never come back again. I may have something that's kind of like it, but it will be different. It will never be the same ever again. And sometimes people experience that when they have illness in their physical body. 
There are people who experience that, you know, every once in a while, you know, man, when I'm watching college football and you see someone, you know, who's got so much promise and then all of a sudden they're, they're going off on a gurney and you go, you know, they've been dreaming about their pro career their whole life and it may have just ended right now. They may never ever see that. This injury may alter that destiny. And when we experience those kind of moments, there's grief. We have to experience that loss. And the holidays, the reason we tend to do something like this during the holidays is the holidays are magnifying glasses, aren't they? If everything in your life is good, man, it just makes it that much better. It just like magnifies it. And if you've got hurt or pain or loss, it does the same thing. It magnifies it. I mean, you know, if, if a person has lost, a, you know, gone through a divorce or something like that, or children have gone off to college or something like that, and it's Friday night, and you're sitting home alone, you know, you go, you know, I'm going to go get a red box and a steak and, you know, have dinner, right? You know, and you go, you know, I mean, it's a bummer. I wish I wasn't here right now. But if the only thing that you've got is a, a red box and a steak on Christmas day, Christmas Eve, boy, it's a whole different animal. The holidays become magnifying glasses. They bring to the surface everything that is going on. And that is the reason that as we walk through this, that we need to realize it's significant. I mean, it matters. Now, as we think about grief, because, again, in America, we're sheltered. We are sheltered. You know, I mean, I, every, every time I get ready to do a funeral, I, get, I gather all the family around, and I go, guys, and, and this is to help you all too, by the way. I gather the family around, and I tell them, I say, hey, guys, in America, we don't do death well at all. You know, there was a time, even in our nation, back before we had so many advances in medical technology, that was a lot like the third world. You know, when somebody, you know, my, even my dad, he was like, you know, hospital's a place where you go to die. How many of you know we don't think that anymore? Right? In America, you're like, if we can get them to the hospital, what's going to happen? They'll do something for them. They'll fix them. They'll get healthy. You know, there was a generation gone by, man, if you went to the hospital or nursing home, you went there to die. You didn't go there to be taken care of. And there was a time in America when someone passed away, you took them to the house, put them in the living room, man. All the neighbors came over, you know, and, you know, and they called it sitting up with the dead. <laughs> you know, everybody'd sit around with the you know with the deceased person in the middle of the living room, right? You know, and they just understood, you know, that that death happens, and and we kind of walk through it. But in America now, it's so sterile. I mean, you know, we we don't do death well. We don't know how to walk through it. And I usually pull families in. I'm gonna go, you know, here's the thing: because we've become so isolated, and medicine has become so strong, people are gonna try to say things to help you, and they are not going to help. Please be aware of that. You know, people are going to walk up and try to go, well, you know, they're in a better place, right? And you go, well, I want them in this place, thank you, right? You know, Jennifer was in the I campus this morning, and she was talking about, uh, can I share that? You shared an I campus, having a miscarriage. And, and people coming up to her and go, well, at least you didn't know the name. Like, that's going to fix something, right? You know, and what, but why do we do that? Because we're trying to what? We're, we're trying to help, but we're horrible at it, right? We're not good because we've been so isolated as a society. We haven't walked through those kind of pains and hurts the way that in, year, in, in decades past or in the third world where they experience this stuff all the time and, the, and every family experiences it. I mean, we've got families in America that have not lost a close relative, not one close relative. When I, you know, when we did Alice's funeral, they sit there and they go, we haven't had a grandparent or a parent pass away in our entire lifetime. It was the first time, and Alice, you know, was the great-grandmother, very first time they had experienced loss in any way in their family. 
In decades gone by, in times gone by, that wasn't the way it was. Everybody experienced a lot of loss because the mortality rate and the health and the ability to fight off infection and disease and modern medicine wasn't around. And they were better at dealing with it, but we're not. Don't try to fix people, folks. If they're going through grief, you know the most important thing? I like this. Uh, Jennifer actually gave this to me. She goes, it's, all, uh, it's about any life issue. Oh, I'm sorry, no. Presence is the best present for someone experiencing grief from a loss or transition. They just need to know you're there and that you love them. You don't need to fix them. You don't need to tell them something that's going to change their life. You just need to be there. And let them be where they are. The second thing I tell people that are going through grief is there's no right way to do this. Whatever you're feeling in the moment, that's what you need to be feeling, right? Don't try to put on to make, you know, what you think other people want, what you think you ought to be. What, no, be what you are because God has designed us to go through grief because we live in a world that has grief in it. And the way that we go through grief, there are about five different stages that have been uh, done. Identify. Understanding what others are going through. So the five stages of grief are this. Denial. This isn't really happening. This isn't going on. Well, yeah, it is, honey. <laughs> that ain't going to help nobody, right? Everyone's going to go through some denial at first. You know, it, it's going to be okay. You know, everything's going to be fine. They're not going, you know. The second thing, anger. I just want to hit somebody. <laughs> what the greatest, greatest scenes in all of movie history is Slap Weezer, right? You know, when Sally Fields has lost her daughter, she goes, I just want to hit somebody. I just want to hit somebody, right? You know, slap Weezer, right? You know, everybody's wanting to do that, right? What? I'm angry, and God created us to experience anger. Anger is not a sin, folks. Anger is an emotion about something that should not be. Anger motivates us to move forward. If I see a child being abused, I don't want to go, wow, that's discouraging. I want to be filled with rage. Why? Because that child needs to be defended and somebody needs to do it. And God wired us that when something like that is happening, we are to become angry. Scripture says when Jesus saw people desecrating the temple of God by defrauding and ripping people off with sacrifices. It made him so angry, he created a whip and drove them out of the temple. He goes, this is a dysfunctional, uh, unbelievable evil that is happening right here, and somebody needs to do something about it. Anger is a response to the fact that this is not the world that God created, and it's wrong, and it shouldn't be that way. The next phase is bargaining. I'll do anything. God, I'll do anything. If you will just, you know, we begin to beg and bargain. And then depression. I can't change this. And it emotionally draws me down. And the last stage is acceptance. To where I go, okay, it's never going to be the same again, but I can still be healthy. I can still be healthy. We still have things to celebrate. We have family to pour our lives into. It's time to move forward. And nobody does these in, in any particular order, and people do them over and over again. You know, I tell people, you know, sometimes you're going to be fine. You're going to be laughing and joking like nothing's ever happened. And then another day, you're just going to be angry, and you just want to smack somebody. And then five minutes later, you're just going to be sad. And you just don't want anybody to try to fix you. You just want to be sad for a while. And then you're going to be okay again. And then you're going to be angry again. Then you're going to be sad again. And then you're going to bargain a little bit. You know, and then you're just going to keep kind of cycling through this because God created us to be emotional beings. And I'm so glad because when my kids were born, I didn't want to do a math problem to figure out what the, you know, the calculations of their lifespan and their the drain on my bank account was going to be for the rest of their lives, right? You know, I mean, I didn't want to look at it analytically. I wouldn't go, that's my son, right? You know, and just run down the hall with him, you know, and just, look what God did, right? You know, I was just, man, I mean, you know, everything in me wanted to celebrate. But we also experience loss with every emotion that we have, too. 
We don't get one without the other. So when people are walking through the holidays, their losses, whether it's the loss of a job, loss of a relationship, some sickness that has altered their life, some place that's going on, the holidays are going to magnify it. And for every single one of us, the best thing that we can do is if we're on the outside looking in, is just be there. And to understand. You know? I mean, if someone has lost a spouse and this is the first, or, or a child, or a, an aunt, or an uncle, and this is the first Christmas they've been through, and all of a sudden they're just edgy and cranky, and, you know, and, and you just go, what is up her nose? Right? You know? <laughs> Or other orifice, I don't know, right? You know, what's, what, what, you know, what is, what's going on here, right? You're going, no, they're experiencing loss. And they're having to walk through it, and this holiday is magnifying it. And they're, yeah, they're a little emotional. They're, you know, they're, they're a little too angry or a little too sad or a little too, you know, whatever else it is. And just go, you know, hey, listen, love on them. Don't try to fix them. Don't try to have a logical conversation with them. Just love them. And if you're one of those individuals, realize that you're going to have some of that. You know? Get it in your mind. If you've experienced a loss this year and you're going through the Christmas, you're probably going to have a moment where you just want to bite somebody's head off. <laughs> or you just feel sad and you just cry and you don't know why. Be aware enough to go, don't try to fix me, just love me. <laughs> and shut up. If you want to do something, hug me. But don't talk to me. <laughs> I'm going to be fine. But right now, I've experienced this loss. And I just need to know you're here with me. Let them off the hook a little bit. You know, just to go, you know, you can't, you can't make it go away. You can't fix it, but you can be here for me. We can do this together. And then for everyone, we've got to focus on the right stuff. Where we focus is where we will stay. It's just the case. And if I choose to focus on everything that is negative and unhealthy, I will take myself down into a very, very dark, very deep hole. And some of us don't realize that, I mean, I'm, I'm just going to tell you, if I were to pass away, and the result of that is my wife and my kids stayed in grief for the next five years, I'm going to tell you, that does not honor me. That is the absolute last thing on the planet I would ever want to have happen. Every once in a while, people go, that's what daddy would have wanted, right? You know, mainly it's because I'm taking something that I want, right? <laughs> but I'm going to tell you what daddy wants for my kids and for my wife. I want them to go on and live with the same passion they live with every day that I was here because that honors my life. Miss me? You're going to miss me. You know, they're going to miss me, hopefully. <laughs> they may have some grief, and everybody, but I don't want them to stay there. Man, I want them to focus on everything that we did that was healthy, everything that was positive. I want them to tell funny stories and laugh till they pee their pants. You know, I mean, that's what I want them to do. And a lot of times we feel like because someone has passed away, we can't go on with joy. Other societies do it much better. Other societies do it really great. Hispanics, man, they know how to do grief. I am telling you, a lot of Latin cultures, baby... When they start bringing the body in, they're everybody in the place. Is, right? You know what I mean? They just wail and moan and fall on the floor and cry. What do we do in America? Right? You know, man, they get it out. And then later on that night, they throw a party. <laughs> Seriously. And... We're uncomfortable with that, but we got to figure it out. Man, I've done a couple of weddings for, other, uh, you know, I mean, for, uh, funerals for other cultures. And, man, when they start bringing them in, you know, you know I mean, I'm sitting there going, you know, th this poor wife, she's never going to be the same. You're just screaming and falls on the floor, and others are laying on her and patting on her back. Just, ah! Right, you know, later on that afternoon, she's healthier than most Americans, right? Because she got it out. She goes, I am hurting, and I am experiencing loss here. But then she went on with her life. Many times we don't realize we got to get it out. 
We got to let it out. We got to tell people, yes, I'm still angry. I am still mad, but it is not going to dictate my life. From time to time, I got to vent it. I just got to push it out there and I got to say, I am still angry. I am still hurt. I am still sad. But then we start focusing on the healthy stuff. In Isaiah 26, 3, we read, You will, God, you, <laughs> will keep in perfect peace. Him whose mind is steadfast because he trusts in you. He goes, God will keep in perfect peace the one whose mind is steadfast because they trust in God. Steadfast mind. To go, I'm not going to get into all this dysfunctional stuff and just sit there and focus on it. I'm going to get my head in the right spot. John 14, 27 says, peace I leave with you. My peace, Jesus said. I give you. I don't give it the way the world gives. So don't let your heart be troubled and do not be afraid. Don't let your heart be troubled. How many of you know we can let our heart be troubled? We can focus on all the stuff that keeps us stuck in the ditch. We have a guy out in Bellevue that credits me for saving his life. Credits me for saving his life because his daughter was tragically killed in an accident when she was nine years old. And the house was a shrine to her. And there was nothing but mourning 24-7 in this house. And someone called me and said, you know, could you just go talk to them? And so I went over there and for an hour and a half, I just asked them one question. One thing. In, in, in all of it. I just said, what made your daughter special? And they took me through the whole house for almost two hours. They talked about everything she had ever done. They talked about every, you know, teddy bear in the bedroom. Right? <laughs> we were through the whole kit and caboodle, man. For two hours, I didn't try to fix or do anything. I, you know, we, all I did was tell me everything about this beautiful little girl. And we went through. And they said, how do we get forward? And I said, well, there's not a single path out of this. I said, but here's the one thing that I want to warn you about. I said, for the last two hours, you've told me everything that you're going to miss, everything you're not going to experience, everything that is no longer a possibility. They talked about, you know, we're not going to get to see her graduate from high school. We're not going to get to see her, you know, uh, uh, get a job, get married, ride a, you know, you know, all these, you know, stuff. And, and, and I go, all of that's true. I mean, it's, it's, it's all very, very true. And I said, but let me ask this question. I said, just this perspective, just because you asked, how do I move forward? I said, let me ask this question. I said, in the, in the nine years that your daughter was there, has she ever felt or experienced tragic loss in her life that created immense grief? And they sat there for a moment, and they said, uh, no, I, I, don't, I don't know that she ever had that. And I said, did she ever have someone rip her heart out by treating her with such disrespect? She ever had a guy just make her want to crawl in a hole and die? And they said, no. And I went through several other things, and I said, well, here's the thing. You've chosen to focus on everything wonderful that would have possibly happened in her life, but everything that I just mentioned would have also happened. I said, you only had your daughter for nine years, and that is way, way too short. But your little girl never had her heart broken by some guy. And I said, but if she lived longer, she would have. And she's never experienced a tragic loss, but if she'd walked through the rest of her life, she'd experience a whole bunch of them. I said, what you have done is you've set up and you've only focused on what you're going to lose, but you don't realize that your daughter in nine years never experienced what almost every single one of us experience. And now she's standing in the presence of God. And I said, that doesn't take the pain away. 
But if you continue to focus only on the good stuff that could have been there and not realize that there would have been other things and that life goes on and that things happen, and you continue to focus on all these little shrines, I said, you'll never move from where you are. You'll stay stuck. And I said, I'm going to pray for you that not only will you celebrate what you had, but you will celebrate what you still have. That you all still love each other. And I said, what you, are, what you have lost here is going to give you a sensitivity to love others with a passion that you couldn't have otherwise. It's going to give you the opportunity to love some little children that didn't have a parent that loved them for the first nine years and they desperately need somebody to tell them they're beautiful. The way that you told your daughter she's beautiful every day of her life. So there are kids all over the place that don't have anyone that tells them they can do great things the way that your daughter heard for nine months. I said, if you want to, you can have a life filled with purpose that radically changes lives. The Bible says we comfort others with the comfort that God has given us, that we love because of what His love has done for us. And not everything turned around in a day, but all of a sudden I started getting these reports that they go, you know, I met so-and-so, you know, and he said you saved his life. And you know, and I met so-and-so, he said you saved his life. And we sat down together, and he goes, from that day forward, he goes, I started looking at the positive as well as the negative. And he goes, finally, we started getting healthy again. We started moving forward. Where my head's at is going to say whether I stay stuck or whether I start getting healthy. Because I looked at him and I said, your daughter lived only nine years, and that is way, 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 way too short. And I cannot tell you what is going on because I haven't lost a daughter at the age of nine. And I said, but I can say with full confidence from the Scripture She's healthier now than she was any of those nine years, and she's fine. And God wants to heal you so that you're fine too. And I said, I can't do that. I can pray for you. I can hug you. I can sit here with you as long as you need. But God's going to have to heal your heart. But he can't do it if you stay focused in the wrong spot. He can't drag you to healthy. You're going to have to walk with him there. And so I just encourage him, you know, take a walk. See what God can do. And that's where we have to go. Because that is the rest of the story. Josh is coming out to sing for you right now. Josh has experienced a lot of loss in his life. But he is one of the most vibrant, alive young men that I know. Because God heals, and he empowers, and he moves us forward. Joshua, come on out of here, buddy. September, my grandmother passed away, and for those of y'all don't know, I lost both my parents to cancer before I was 13. So as John said, I've kind of dealt with a lot of loss in my life, and um, after my grandmother died, I, I spent a lot of time with my grandpa at his house, and he kind of changed the way he does things these days, of course, and um, one of those things is he doesn't use the word goodbye anymore. You know, it's not allowed. It's always, I'll see you later. He says, you know, I'm not going to tell you goodbye. I'll just tell you, see you later. And being a songwriter, I left that day going, okay, I've got to write that. Um, so this is kind of for my grandmother. These faded pictures cover up my me you're not here and my heart begins to fall it only hurts so much because I love you just to feel your touch there's nothing I wouldn't do and no you're not coming back and I hate it this ain't goodbye no no Out drawers of clothes you'll never 
try all But I had a good cry When I heard our song I missed the way you helped me Now everything feels wrong Cause I'm left here without you In this bed here all alone It only hurts so much Cause I love you just to feel your touch There's nothing I wouldn't do I know you're not coming back And I hate it This ain't goodbye No, no As I stare out into the night, I see you in a star, and I know where you are. It wouldn't hurt so much if I didn't love you, just to feel your touch. There's nothing I wouldn't do. I know you're not coming back, but I'm still. This ain't goodbye Let's pray. Father, Lord, some of us have to say that. Things have changed, and they'll never be the same, but they can still be healthy. We have this hope that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And you said we can comfort each other with these words. We will always be with the Lord together that we will be reunited with everyone that we've lost. And Father, for those that have lost a relationship, lost health, lost a job, that very real grief is there as well. Because it's not going to be the same. It's not going to come back. It's, it's going to be forever different. But Father, that you would help us to get our head in the right spot to go, we can thrive. That you will be the God of all peace, that you have come to bind up the brokenhearted and heal their wounds, that you can give us purpose even after the pain, and that ultimately it is assuring for us perfection for eternity. God, it is a hard road, but it is a road that you have not abandoned us on. You walk with us daily, and so Father, we ask for your supernatural provision to guard us and to guide us. Lord, as we walk through these holidays and certain aspects of our life get magnified and the lives of others are magnified, Lord, that we won't try to fix anybody, but that we'll just be there. That we will love and understand. And that God, in the middle of all of it, you will be the one who heals and restores, the God of all comfort. Do that for us in Jesus' name. Amen.